um, have this webinar. This webinar is presented by a joint of uh, partners that are producing the fourth National Math Summit. We'll have it next June in, in uh, Vegas as a pre-conference to the NOS conference. Um, our, spot, our presenters today are Connie Richardson, who you will hear from first, Ann Edwards, and who will be second, and then Helen Byrne will finish things up. Um, as we go through the webinar, we ask that you put your questions in the chat window and we will answer those at the end. Uh, presenters might be responding to questions as well as we go through this. Um, and, but here's a couple of reminders and just some housekeeping things. The webinar recording policy, as you see there, AMATIC is recording the webinar. We appreciate AMATIC's partnership for the summit and for their um, hosting the webinar. They retain the right to show it again and to distribute it. And by participating, you agree that you are making contributions and becoming a part of that recording. Please make sure that you are muted. You can open the chat by clicking at the bottom of your screen if you haven't done that already. And be sure to switch from panelist to all panelists, so that all attendees, so that everyone can see your comments. We will have limited time, but type your question in the chat. We will save the chat and, and later they can address questions if we don't have time to get to those today. Please be open to new ideas and as always, kind in your comments to others. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Connie as she is going to start the presentation and share her screen. Thanks, Annette. Hi, everybody. It's great to see some uh, familiar names. And let me share here. We, we have uh, control issues, I think. <laughs> so we all decided that we would like to uh, control our own destiny and be able to um, uh, share our own slides. And I'm having trouble getting my window uncovered. So there we go. All right. So advancing equity in math pathways in the era of the pandemic. That's a lot of words. Um, and looking at what people put into the chat. Uh, different pieces of that title are what uh, attracted people. We chose this title because recent research is really revealing some deeper layers to math pathways and the relationship that they have to equity. Um, the conditions that we're in with the pandemic could lead us to backsliding on our pathways work, um, but it's also an opportunity for us to move forward and to innovate and to double down in our focus on equity and make sure that our math pathways are serving our students equitably. Um, there were some questions about what equitable might mean uh, in the chat. And so when we think about um, equity and math pathways, when, when math pathways first uh, came about, there were some concerns about, um, you know, uh, putting students into different pathways. This could end up to tracking. We could divert students out of STEM, for example. Um, if we look over the past um, four CBMS surveys um, on uh, just kind of an excerpt of enrollment, from the different pathways at two-year institutions, we can see that statistics has more than tripled uh, in enrollment. Uh, math for liberal arts, quantitative reasoning kind of courses have more than doubled uh, in enrollment. Um, when we look at um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, as a proportion of the whole in 2000, uh, college algebra and calculus, kind of the algebraic pathway was well over half of the students. Um, but now uh, in, at the most recent survey in 2015, then we see that um, uh, statistics is uh, gradually overtaking uh, college algebra in proportion. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're decimating the algebraic path or, or hurting the STEM pipeline necessarily. Um, and as we look at um, moving across uh, from 2000 to 2015, we've seen a significant growth in college algebra enrollment and some growth in calculus enrollment. Um, and so we are still growing the STEM pathway. Uh, what we want to do is be sure that students are in the right pathway uh, that's going to serve their, their goals the best. So if we take kind of this quick trip down memory lane when the Dana Center and Carnegie Math Pathways were first working together on Math Pathways, uh, then we thought that this is a strategy that could really impact equity by breaking down barriers to student success and completion in mathematics. Uh, we know that inaccurate placement policies, for example, disproportionately impact uh, black and brown students. Um, and so, uh, and that, that the, the um, traditional prerequisite sequence, which was completely well intentioned, um, actually disproportionately impacts um, minoritized students. And so by accelerating students um, and giving them um, 
quicker opportunities at uh, college level courses and giving them opportunities to access college level courses that will actually help them be more successful in their academics and in their career goals um, is one way to address equity. But there are still some outstanding questions about that. Um, it could devolve into tracking if we're not careful, for example. So we really have to be careful about that. And when you think about the pandemic and how the pandemic has impacted students' access, um, uh, you know, technology issues disproportionately impact students of color. Uh, all those things mean that that um, that students could be harmed even more during this pandemic era. So we really have to uh, attend to these equity concerns even more. So uh, if we take kind of the, the high level 30,000 foot view of math pathways, um, then these are kind of, uh, you know, the hardest hitting highest level goals here that making sure that students have math content content that is going to support their academic and professional goals, accelerating students who've been underserved in the past, and then really working on the learning environment. If students have never had the opportunity in the past, when we look at bullet two, students who have been underserved, some students have never had the opportunity to truly act as a mathematician in class. Um, they've been given opportunities to drill and kill, for example, which is not what mathematicians do. Uh, so if students have not been given those opportunities to act as mathematicians and to engage in math that is relevant to their lives and their careers, uh, then we want to provide learning environments now that uh, make up for those deficiencies um, that they were exposed to in the past. And so uh, helping them identify, uh, develop their identities as mathematical learners, um, and as well as working on uh, their dispositions and their skills and their learner strategies that will impact them more broadly as well in their other academics and, uh, and as they get out into the workforce. So if we zoom in a little bit, uh, then let's talk about what equitable math pathways would look like. So we really need to start in K-12 uh, and look at K-12 as being a foundation rather than a filter. Oh, I want to back up a little bit and say, you know, there's been a lot of research about equity. There's been a lot of press about equity this year. Um, and equity in mathematics, or maybe better stated would be inequity in mathematics. Um, and so uh, Just Equations has published a series of reports specifically about equity in math pathways. So I just want to refer you to the Just Equations website when you, uh, you know, get a chance to check them out if you haven't seen any of their publications, uh, really focusing on equity in math pathways. And so um, this particular slide has content from uh, uh, from a recent report that they issued. So K-12 foundation, we want to make sure students are getting a common foundation um, that, uh, that up to grade 10, students should be having rigorous exposure to uh, uh, mathematical content uh, common across all students. Um, so that means detracking. In other words, it means we shouldn't be racing to see which students get to take Algebra 1 earliest, right? We should be looking at the research on cognitive development and providing Algebra 1 at the appropriate point. Um, and then, uh, and, and so up through Algebra 1 geometry, that level of content should be common across all students. And then from uh, the junior year on, then students should have rigorous options. Um, so if we think about um, that if students have already identified what their career aspirations are, um, then perhaps statistics is more relevant. Perhaps data science is more relevant. Perhaps a quantitative reasoning course would be more relevant. So you might be working with your partner K-12 districts in providing dual credit courses, for example, those are just uh, really heavily weighted for college algebra. Um, and college algebra, you know, is appropriate for some students. But try working with your districts. I know that oftentimes districts ask for college algebra, but if you'll work with them to um, uh, make them aware uh, of other options that you could offer them statistics as a, as a dual credit course or a quantitative reasoning or data science course as a, a dual credit course, that gets those students accelerated. Many of those students who take college algebra as dual credit 
end up having to take something else once they get um, to their uh, post-secondary uh, goals anyway. So let's see if we can uh, do that in advance. Uh, for post-secondary, we want to make sure that the qualities, that the, that the options are high quality. So uh, for example, um, uh, in a lot of places, um, the Math for Liberal Arts course is ill-defined. Um, all sorts of things happen in those courses. So let's beef up that course. Um, uh, make sure that that course is truly serving the students and serving the programs that it's intended to serve uh, rather than um, just having it be instructor choice, for example. Uh, and then rethinking our teaching and assessments so that they are research based and culturally responsive to students, right? So, um, so understanding that a lot of the ways that we um, uh, engage in instruction uh, currently may not be serving our students in the best way uh, and looking at some of the research base around student-centered teaching. So um, as we think about all that, then what can you do is to like take some notes of things that you're going to check out. Um, are your math pathways serving the right students? So you might be offering options to your students, but are the right students in those options? Um, are they being served equitably? Uh, look within your pathways to see um, uh, are students proportionally represented, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, et cetera, Pell eligible? Are they being equitably represented in the pathways or are us uh, or some student populations tending to be in, um, in programs within pathways that are lower paying, for example? Um, and are your pathways uh, contributing to a strong STEM pipeline? Um, thinking about supports, uh, Anna's going to talk in a minute about co-requisites. Um, sometimes co-requisites um, are not, uh, uh, students don't have equitable access to co-requisites, particularly a lot of people were not offering co-requisites virtually. Uh, and then, oh man, campus closed down in March and it's like, what do we do now? We have to offer our, our co-reqs virtually and we're not ready to do that. So just some recent research tools um, that, uh, that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna focus on number one, program analysis tools for equitable access. Um, and just I just wanna make you aware of this tool. CCRC recently um, released this report about unpacking program enrollments and completions with equity in mind. And so it's what I was talking about a while ago. Let's look inside our pathways and are we seeing that minoritized students are being shunted off into a particular pathway, for example? Um, or uh, are, are the programs within this pathway, some of them are high wage and some of them are low wage. Well, who are the students in the high wage programs? Um, and how can we uh, better attend to making sure that students are getting equitable access to those programs? Um, so I do want to uh, click out of this for a minute just to um, get to, let me see. Um, oh, sorry. All right. Got to get that out of the way. Can get it to close out. Here it is. And share screen just really quick. So this is what the website looks like. Um, and I hope Annette is able to share that link for you uh, to get to the website. And as we scroll down, then I just really wanted to make sure you saw this, that there is a data tool that will help you with that analysis of figuring out, um, you know, what programs your students are in and, uh, and which students are being served by those programs so that you can analyze whether they are being served equitably. Um, and so, uh, Anne, are you ready for us to, to switch over to talking about the relationship between pathways and co-requisites? Sure. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. Hi, everybody. While I'm doing that, let's see if I can talk and find at the same time. My name is Ann Edwards, and I'm from the Carnegie Math Pathways at West Ed. And is everybody seeing this? Okay. All right. Oh, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I need to be able to see my notes. Okay, there we go. Um, so I wanted to start um, by 
sort of um, giving us a shared um, definition of what we mean by co-requisite remediation. Um, it's been around for a while and there is, uh, there is a sort of predominant um, movement in, um, in the field that is taking up co-requisites as a solution to um, improving student outcomes. And so it's incumbent upon us to sort of start with a shared understanding of what we might be talking about. So um, simply put, co-requisite remediation is when students directly enroll into a college level course like college algebra or college statistics concurrently with some form of ac additional academic support as opposed to the traditional model of developmental education in which students must first succeed in prerequisite remediation before enrolling in college level coursework. And the reason why um, co-requisite remediation is a part of this particular webinar is that um, some recent studies have shown that while co-requisite remediation, I'll get into this in more detail in a minute, um, is effective um, for certain outcomes, um, it's increasingly clear that that co-requisite remediation is a complement to um, reforms like math pathways and can amplify the effects of math pathways. Um, and it's even a, a particular um, mechanism through which the um, effects of math pathways um, happen. So um, that's why we thought it would be important to address research and practice on co-requisites in this webinar. Okay, so while this particular definition seems straightforward, the actual reality of implementation is pretty complex. There is a lot of variation in co-requisite implementation models out there right now. For example, there are differences in the degree of alignment of the content and pedagogy of the college level course and the co-requisite support. There are also lots of different ways that the co-requisite supports are actually delivered, for example, as workshops or as quote, regular lecture-based courses or technology-based supplemental materials or even as kind of embedded prerequisites. Um, and then, of course, there are differences in how the courses are organized, for example, whether or not students um, are structured as cohorts in which they have the same instructor and are in the same class um, in both the college and co-requisite support components. So I'll get into more details about variation and implementation in some of the lessons learned later. But first, no, no, how do I, there we go. First, let's talk a little bit about why co-requisites might be a good idea. Um, so, um, there are a lot of arguments, despite the variability that I just talked about, that suggest that co-requisites are a promising way to improve student outcomes. First, placement mechanisms have been shown to be inaccurate in some and perhaps many cases, identifying some students that require remediation even though they are proficient at the college level and can actually pass college level coursework. And, and I know in the field there's been a lot of discussion about um, placement and there's been a lot of evidence that uh, placement practices can be inaccurate. So co-requisites allow these students to enroll directly into college level work. Second, co-requisites reduce the course sequence, eliminating potential exit points, um, thereby increasing student momentum and earning, earning college credits. Third, students who are required to take remedial coursework often feel stigmatized and may often have aversions um, to the high school content they already took. So co-requisite courses in which they do college level work immediately may be more motivating and engaging for students. And finally, in many implementations, the content of the co-requisite um, is more closely aligned to students' programs and career interests, like we see with um, complementary math pathways reforms, thereby improving the relevance of the mathematics to students and making the content less abstract and more concretely meaningful to them. So we can see the co-requisite um, has much to recommend it, but what do we actually know about its effectiveness implement implementation and design at this time? It's still pretty early. So I'm gonna start with this sort of broad question of do co-requisites quote work um, and start with sort of evidence of effectiveness that's out there. But first a quick pause. Um, today I'm gonna to provide only a very quick review of what the current primary studies have found. Fortunately for us, Uri Treisman is gonna be giving a webinar solely focused on co-requisites on February 2nd, providing a deeper dive into the research as well as implications for faculty departments and administrators. Please look for announcements of this upcoming webinar if you want to learn more. So in general, when we talk about whether co-requisites are working, the research is generally looking at these outcomes. First, the rate of students passing college level or gateway courses, uh, their gateway course within one year. Um, second, 
a longer term subsequent um, college course, college level course taking and credit accumulation in both general education and specifically also in mathematics. And then finally, of course, longer term graduation and transfer rate outcomes. In the past several years, there have been a number of studies, the, a lot of which have been descriptive, but some uh, randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental studies looking at the effectiveness of co-requisites in different disciplines and different contexts. Um, and in particular for math co-requisites, there have been studies um, in Tennessee, the City University of New York, and Texas. And I'm gonna spend just a second giving you a little bit of context about these studies so that um, in the next slide when I talk about their, um, their results, these might make a little bit more. This, of sense. So in 2013, Tennessee underwent a system-wide implementation of co-requisites in the 13 colleges of the Tennessee Board of Regents system. Um, the study of that implementation employed regression discontinuity analysis and included the longer term outcomes three years out. Um, in the City University of New York, uh, an RCT was conducted in 2013 with three colleges implementing statistics co-requisites that study also looked at the longer term academic performance outcomes. The same research group also did an additional quasi experimental study of um, course pass rates with four CUNY colleges. And then in Texas, which is another state like Tennessee with widespread adoption of co-requisites, a number of different studies are um, preliminary or ongoing. One study is a regression discontinuity analysis of outcomes of students statewide who enrolled in co-requisite math um, in the years 2014 and 16, and I'll be telling you a little bit about that study. There is also an RCT study of five colleges English co-requisites, which because it's English, I'm not gonna be referring to much here, but I would encourage you to read all of these and um, the deck will include the references to all these studies. Oh, a couple of quick notes about the study um, that might be important later. The sample in the Tennessee study were uh, what quote bubble students who were close to placement in the gateway course. Um, this was also true for the Texas uh, math study. And another important detail to note is that the CUNY RCT study focused, um, like I mentioned, only on statistics co-requisite, whereas the others included other gateway math courses. Okay, so what did these studies find? Okay. Um, so the first outcome, passing college level courses within one year. All of the primary studies agreed that students in co-requisite courses were more likely to pass their gateway math course within a year as compared to those in prerequisite remediation. And actually in Tennessee, um, compared with students who were initially placed directly into college level, these students had similar gateway course completion rates. Um, these findings across these primary studies are of course important in and of themselves as this um, saves students time and effort. But we're also interested in the more lasting effects. Um, and this is where we see some variation in the results. So um, subsequent course taking and credit accumulation, um, the Tennessee and CUNY studies both found that successful co-requisite students were more likely to enroll in and pass subsequent college level math courses than prerequisite students. And the CUNY study also found that these students were more likely to have passed their gen ed requirements after three years. However, the Texas study found that there was no significant impact on credit accumulation and progress to degree um, three years after they took the co-requisite course. And then similarly for graduation and transfer, while the CUNY study found that co students were more likely to graduate um, three years out within the three years, the Texas and Tennessee studies did not find significant impact on these longer term outcomes. So these variations um, are perhaps a little bit puzzling, but, and I won't have time to get into a more detailed analysis of why, why we might be seeing these differences, and I'm hoping that um, Uri will spend more time um, actually unpacking this. But the authors suggest that key differences in both the, the co-requisite implementation in these different institutions, as well as the study methods might be factors. Notably, because the CUNY, CUNY study focused only on statistics co-rec, which was better aligned to students' programs, that might have been a factor um, that we see long-term effects. And that also the differences in the study methods meant that the students in the Texas and Tennessee studies were relatively close to the cutoffs for gateway course placement, whereas the CUNY study included uh, students of broader placement bands, and so that might also account for differences in the longer term outcomes. Okay, so despite these differences, what can we take away? So I think it's quite clear um, so far that co-requisite remediation gets students through gateway math faster and just as well. Also, 
Um, the author suggests that implementation of co-requisites with math pathways reforms may support longer term effects. Um, although the jury is still out and the authors say that it might be that two or three years is just not long enough to be able to see that. However, um, they also suggest that um, the improvements that we are that we might be seeing are not guaranteed after gateway course completion, meaning that math gateway course completion, while vital, isn't the sole determinant of longer term outcomes. And that kind of seems obvious. There's a lot that goes on with students after they take their um, math um, gateway course. But so what they suggest is that students need additional support at every step along the way to college completion and that we need to be doing research on that whole um, educational journey that students undertake. There are still clearly a lot of open questions that need investigating and in the end of my time I'll return to that. But for now I want to spend a few minutes um, considering the growing body of knowledge from the field based on what practitioners are actually doing because there's a lot of practitioners actually doing this. There is a growing consensus about the design and implementation of co-requisites based on what we're seeing in the field and also in alignment with um, you know, what is known about math pathways design um, that Connie actually already outlined. So first, students should be enrolled in the college level math course aligned to their chosen program path. You know, this aligns very well, of course, with math pathways. Second, the content and outcomes of the college level course with um, co-requisite supports should be identical to those of non-co-requisite sections of that course. There shouldn't be any changing or quote dumbing down. Um, third, instructional practice across the college level math course and co-requisite support course should be consistent. Students should be experiencing the same kinds of instructional approach. Next, the content in the co-requisite support course should be explicitly aligned and organized to support student learning and success in the college level course. They need to be closely related and the co-requisite needs to support what's happening in the college level. There should be attention to socio-emotional factors impacting participation and learning. For example, strategies to boost academic confidence, social belonging, and understanding of the relevance of mathematics to students' everyday life and to achieving their goals. And then finally, and very importantly, there needs to be explicit attention to equitable participation and outcomes through instructional practice, content, and curriculum. So these are the shoulds of design and implementation, sort of gleaning what we've learned across the field. And so what I want to do now is sort of dive a little bit into um, what this looks like in, in a particular implementation and what we have learned in the Carnegie Math Pathways about how to actually get this done. Okay, so a little bit on, on the context of the Carnegie Math Pathways and Corex. Um, so we've learned a lot about design and implementation from our network members. Um, CMP has offered the single semester co-rec versions of Statway and Quantway since fall 2018. To date, 21 institutions have taught these courses with about 2,000 students enrolled in total. And the overall course success rate is about 71%. So what have we learned? So first, we have seen and heard that the use of student-centered and collaborative instructional practices, again, aligned in both the college and the co-rec components is critical. We've also heard that the use of curricular content that is relevant and aligned to students' program needs and career interests and contexts for the mathematics that is relevant to students' lives is also critical for ongoing engagement and learning. We've also found that higher numbers of contact hours correlate to higher success rates. Um, specifically, in our um, network, institutions that, that structured with only four weekly contact hours average a success rate of approximately 40%, whereas institutions with five and six weekly contact hours had success rates in the 60%, so 61% for five weekly contact hours and 67% for six weekly contact hours. Um, and then lastly, most of our institutions use a cohort model where the students have the same faculty member teaching both college and co-rec portions of the course. Um, instructors noted that they felt that this approach was really important for student comfort, consistent social support, and continuity of pedagogical approaches, as well as it helped them um, continually make adjustments to the course's content and timeline. Okay, and then some suggestions for implementation, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to super quick go through this. Um, adequate preparation time for instructors is crucial. That seems clear. Um, instructors also said that flexibility and adaptability is really important, but 
They really underscored to prioritize consistency in the instructional practice, even if you're running out of time, and ensuring completion of the college level materials, even if you're running out of time. Um, they also strongly suggested that learning students' needs early is critically important, um, even if it takes more time. And they also, and they suggested that slowing down the first two weeks of the course um, could be a place in which um, instructors do that work. As well, the CMP courses devote a significant part of the first couple weeks to establishing inclusive learning environments that promote productive persistence. This is another thing that is critically important to do and does you know, sort of help to slow down the first two weeks of the course. Um, this also contributes to sort of establishing student expectations and support. Since the um, co-requisite courses are more intensive, it was helpful to find meaningful ways to encourage students, um, like reminding them how far they have come um, and throughout the course. Students should be presented with realistic expectations early and often, including the number of hours of work expected in class and at home. Um, this is a very different experience for students and they need to be continually reminded of that. And then lastly, um, the critical importance of instructor support and opportunities for collaboration was something that our instructors con consistently cited. Okay, so despite learning a great deal from the lessons from the field and the extant research, there is still a lot more we need to know and should be looking at to further improve student outcomes. And this is really squarely about equity. Um, because to be perfectly frank, the research to date, while it points to the potential uh, for co-requisites to support um, equity and to lessen equity apps, um, the research really isn't quite there yet. So we need to better understand for what students are co-requisites less effective. What do we know about the students who are not succeeding with co-requisites and how can their then co-requisites better serve those students? More broadly, how can co-requisites be designed for equity in curriculum and in pedagogy and in structure? Um, what other reforms um, are complementary with and amplify the effectiveness of co-requisites in particular for our most vulnerable students? And then lastly, what data should institutions be looking at to know whether their co-requisite is quote, working and importantly, for whom? And I'm gonna end with a kind of call. I'm gonna end with a call for, for continuous improvement. What we want to do is engage together to improve outcomes um, for our students. And in this particular case, um, outcomes with respect to co-requisites. To do that, institutions and instructors need to be collecting and examining not only summative outcome data, but also proximal outcome and process outcome data and disaggregating those data by student group in the different ways that matter for your institution. So data like within course outcome data and implementation data during the course that tells you something about what elements are working and working for whom. This is a kind of thing that will improve um, that will inform our collective improvement efforts and will help us all to continue to learn more together. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Helen and stop sharing. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Helen Byrne. I am a faculty member at Highline College which is located in a suburb of Seattle. I come to you right now from my home in Seattle. Uh, I'm going to share with you, I'm also Pathways Joint Subcommittee Chair for AMATIC, which is one of the reasons I was invited here, but I also have been, had the pleasure of working on a STEM Math Pathway grant, NSF grant, for the last five years with a very esteemed group of scholars of color, which are listed here. It's been a huge learning experience for me, and I'm gonna share some of the findings. Uh, I'm grateful to the National Sound Science Foundation for supporting this, to my college for supporting my research in addition to teaching, um, and also really grateful for the experiences that I've had with this group of scholars that has helped me um, as a white educator kind of understand where my blind spots are and that uh, racial equity um, requires a lot more professional development of me and growth. So I'm grateful for that, and I hope you have similar experiences on your campus. The actual grant's called Transitioning Learners to Calculus in Community Colleges. We call it TLC3. Our goal is to identify practices to enhance the success of racially minoritized students in the STEM math pathway. And our change strategy involves developing tools for the, we call it an institutional self-assessment tool. And I'm going to show some of those and Annette's going to help me by posting them in the chat window. 
Our research approach is first we're race conscious. Definitely, you can't think about racial equity without talking about race. We're also interdisciplinary. We have researchers from math education. We have researchers from community college student success. Uh, I kind of straddle both worlds. We are standing on the shoulders of giants with our work, but we also conducted our own research. We did a national survey of math chairs. We did case studies of minority serving institutions. Me, I visited an Anapizi college that had a high Southeast Asian American student population. And we have a really good advisory board. So what I'm sharing with you today also went through a rigorous content validation activity with our advisory board. The STEM math pathway has, excuse me, the STEM math pathway has multiple domains. So one of my messages for you here um, is that you can't do everything on your college, but you can't just do one thing. The pathway involves placement, courses, instruction, student support, and institutional responsibility. These are the, these are the five domains that I'm gonna to talk to you about. But overall, the STEM math pathway has particular challenges. It receives less attention than the other pathways. When pathways started, it was almost like everyone said, oh great, we already have the STEM math pathway. Um, and then people focused more on the other pathways. The course sequence is long. I was gonna show you a picture of the pathway at my college, but I think most of you know what it looks like. It's about six courses and that, six courses at the college level. And if you come in at the pre-college or the developmental level, there's even more. And the underrepresentation of racially minoritized students and faculty um, is orders of magnitude different than in the other pathways. So as we get into the tools I'm gonna to share with you, I'd ask you to think about who are the racially minoritized student groups on your campus that are of interest. I work at a very diverse campus, so we have a plurality, um, but uh, I'd like you to think about who are you concerned about underserving at your college and working on improving. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is a one pager. Um, I would say, and Annette, you could post that in the chat window, this, this lists all of our equity practices in the domains, and I would say what I found at my college and in the larger community in Washington State is we're using the pandemic as an opportunity to do planning, to build infrastructure, to develop action plans. Part of that is enabled by the fact that um, in Washington State, we are, well, 75% of math faculty identify as white. We have gender parity, but in Washington State, it's even more white. So we tend to be more privileged during the pandemic. So I you see people really stepping up and planning. Here's a copy of our institutional self-assessment tool that has all of our domains and indicators. These are equity practices that should have enhanced positive effect on racially minoritized students. So that's a one pager that Annette put in to the chat window. I'm going to just show you our first, sorry, that got a little, something happened with the formatting. That's all right. Um, we've talked a lot about placement, so I'm not going to uh, belabor this, but I want to focus on our third equity practices to highlight policies and, place, and practices that ensure highest possible placement. That's the goal. Many racially minoritized students, well, for most students, but this is where they, the rubber hits the road, where they start the pathway. And if they are inequitably placed, that can do significant damage, not just in terms of their academic identity, where they may have a more challenge with um, sense of belonging, but also um, it incurs additional costs in terms of time and money if they have to take unnecessary courses. And I thought you might wanna see some results from our national survey where when you look at these placement policies to ensure higher placement, testing out, allowing faculty and staff to override, revisiting placement after the term begins, you see that as you go up the food chain in math, the placement policies become less generous. There's another way to access our tools, to access our tools, and that is we've created a multi-page document with an interactive response set. So Annette's gonna put that um, into the chat window. This, again, is freely available for anyone to use. It's paid for by the, on behalf of the National Science Foundation. And that's what this looks like. This is a multi-page document. And what's nice about this is in addition to the equity practices, we also have a response set that allows you to, to think about to what extent has your college implemented the practice and 
are your racially minoritized students aware of this practice? That's something that we call transparency. So you can have something, but you need to make students aware of it as well as other campus stakeholders. So I'm gonna jump to um, our fourth dimension, our fourth domain, which is student support and show you this is a copy of our interactive self-assessment tool. And I just wanna highlight one that I think is really interesting to uh, get based on what I saw in the chat window. The second one, dedicated space is available on campus for students to gather and work together on mathematics. So when we say student support, we tend to mean out of class student support. There's a couple of things to think about. Um, this is a finding that actually occurred in a previous study that I was involved in, a national study of calculus. Colleges really felt the importance of having a space on campus for students to do work. And let me link this to um, race ethnicity. On the one hand, when you provide space on campus, that's a place for students to create a community of learners, number one. Number two, it's an excellent opportunity to have those positive faculty-student interactions. And what we know is faculty-student inter interactions are a key um, activity that supports student success. However, we also know that there's a racial dimension here, and I'll um, bring out Southeast Asian students, their studies coming out of California um, that show that Southeast Asian students can suffer from what's, from what's called the model minority myth. They become invisible as if they don't need help. The racial stereotype that Asians are good at math. And the reports are that students can report going all the way through their uh, experience at the college without having any significant interaction with the faculty outside of class. So this dedicated space is another spot for that. And then there's also just the reality that for many of our students, they have extra demands on them once they get home. So providing space on campus is key. Now, um, this concerns me with the pandemic. And I wonder how colleges are responding to that. So I wanted you to think about that. There's another way to access our tools. Given that we're in the pandemic, we decided that we would make an online form. It's a Qualtrics survey. Annette, you can put the link in the chat window for me, please. This allows you to go through the self-assessment, talk uh, check boxes about how you're implementing these, whether your students are aware of them. If you're interested in follow-up, we have funding available through this academic year. I can issue a report to you that you can download and share with your colleagues. So I really hope that um, some people decide to engage with that form. For the remainder of my time, I um, have talked about two of the domains, but I wanna talk, just kind of touch on the other three very briefly. So one of them is STEM math courses, and we all know that this is um, a big deal. In this pathway, the coursework is long and arduous. So we just have some basic equity practices. Think about, are you implementing these and are your students aware? Uh, optimizing the course sequence and the course materials for timely progress. And of course, transfer is huge. But this is also our domain where we stuffed in what and addressed what Anne said about data. Um, actually, everyone's addressed data. So this is where we put our um, equity practice around looking at disaggregated student outcomes. And that could be at the course level, that could be throughput data, that could be assessment data, like on student learning, and all of that data, if you care about equity, you're gonna disaggregate it by race, ethnicity, within gender. That is what needs to be done, and um, we put it underneath the course domain. This one is also really interesting. This is where, okay, think about it at your college. How, what's the ethos and culture in your math program? And what's the ethos and culture and values at the institutional level around racial equity in pathways and STEM? And are they in alignment? Um, they, they, we have to be in alignment and the institution has to step up and offer permanent based funding. Now I'm I'm saying should, this is an ideal world, this would be happening. But um, this is a, a equity practice that permanent base funding is provided. Also ongoing professional development on things that we know matter to improve racial equality in the math classroom. Uh, full and part-time faculty need to be considered. And I would say that a challenge that we heard in the field 
is that often faculty are offered this professional development, but it's not grounded in mathematics. And that's a challenge. So make it, what is, how does this look in the math classroom? And then the last area, which I saved for last, is instruction. And I just have about a minute or two to address this. I wanna explain what we did here. So it's always been for the, like, the last 10 years, I felt like all this good research is coming out in equity practices and instruction, teaching students of color in community colleges. And then we have the math ed world that's dealing with general high quality math instruction. So it's always been my dream to bring them together. And this is how we did it. We actually kind of tried to separate them for the practitioners. We took what does the math ed world say is high quality math instruction and what are the equity practices? And we developed really great classroom observation protocols. We went into classrooms and then we saw what happened. And so these practices are, I would say, realistic practices. This is what people actually did. So I'm gonna give two examples. The first one on math instructional practices in the math ed world, active learning is huge. Everyone's promoting active learning, all these grants on active learning. But here's what we really saw in terms of active learning. We saw students' active involvement in problem solving is central to mathematics instruction. Students were actively solving problems. They weren't doing complicated forms of active learning, but they were active in problem solving, abstract problems, application problems. We saw this consistently in the classes that we um, visited. If I move over to the relational instructional practices, um, this is one where I've, when I've worked with math faculty on this so far, light bulbs go off. And I'm like, wow, I see these two different parts of my teaching. But um, there's still a lot of professional learning to go along with this. And so I'd like to um, make my final point on this is around this idea of welcomeness to engage, which is under the first relational practice. So math faculty need to own and be aware that our students are skeptical about us, their lived experiences in mathematics classes and in the education system leads them to be skeptical of our intentions, that we often pay lip service to engagement, but when it comes to true student engagement, they're leery about it. We need to own that and accept it. Um, so welcomeness to engage is the notion that we signal to students that their engagement is not just welcomed, but that it's desired. And then we walk our talk and we want them to engage with us. Why doesn't this happen in a math classroom? Well, in the STEM math pathway, the big deal is content coverage. The research shows faculty are primarily interested in maintaining the momentum and flow of their planned lesson because they have to cover. So the idea of really authentically engaging with the student, taking their comments, using them to advance the lesson, that can derail things. So there's a lot of things that work against this happening. So all of this to say is these instructional practices can often be the toughest ones to actually um, make change with on your college campus. So I remind you that the math pathway has many domains. Um, and so if this, this kind of work isn't possible at your campus, there may be other things that you could develop action plans around. So with that, I thank you. I have a few references. I remind you that we do have funding for the remainder of the, of the year if you'd like us to visit your campus by Zoom um, or engage in other ways. Thanks for your time. And I know it's become a cliche, but given what's happening with COVID, please, extra precautions, stay safe. All right, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Connie um, and Ann. Um, I'm going to share my screen briefly and show you just a few more things, but get questions ready. We've had some great stuff going on in the chat room. And um, I want that to continue. And these ladies can will have a few minutes to um, to answer questions live. But just a few reminders. Um, this the summit. This is a webinar sponsored by the Fourth National Math Summit that is coming up in June. We really hope that we're going to be able to travel by then, and we'll see you there in person. We have a great schedule lined up. You see the planning team and the steering committee there. Um, it will start on Monday the 14th around one o'clock in the afternoon and go through Tuesday the 15th until five. Jenna Carpenter 
is going to be the keynote speaker and do a concurrent session. Um, and she will be presenting on equity. And you can register at the NOS.org for that. Um, we do have some more webinars sponsored by the Summit Partners coming up. You see, we will not have one in November because of the AMATIC conference and not in December, but the next one coming up is in January. And then we have more in February and March. Um, and so now we're going to take a moment. I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to um, let the presenters share, I mean, answer any questions that you have come in. They've done a great job along the way. There's been great conversations going on, but we do have about 10 minutes left. Um, who's got a question? If you'll put it in the chat, we'll be glad. They'll see it and they can respond. You can even address it to either Connie, Ann, or Helen if you would like to, and they'll be glad to answer it. Or ladies, presenters, if you have anything you want to share, this is a great time. Anything additional you want to share? Um, here comes a question. How can I involve, um, how can she get involved in this research? So Helen, that would probably go to you or Connie. I would say it's really ironic that, again, if you are in a certain privileged position during this pandemic, you actually, there's a lot of opportunities to engage. Um, so I would say, if you want to get involved at all, just reach out to me. I'm basically here all the time, <laughs> right here. <laughs> and I did put the email address for each presenter in the chat. By the way, you will be getting a copy of the presentation as well as a link to the recording. Pat Riley, who manages the coordinates the webinars for AMATIC, does a great job of sending those out promptly once they're available. So you will get both of those things um, in the next few days. And, the, and the, there, that includes the chat. Um, the chat is recorded and is included in that as well. So that's always- Rachel very has an interesting question. Rachel Bates' question about advanced mathematics in high school. And this really um, triggers me in some ways because the probability that a community college student switches to a STEM major is pretty slim. So it's really about the high schools. Connie, I don't wanna you know, pass this off to you, but somehow I think you might have something to say about this comment. Do you see Rachel's? It came in at 1150. Yeah, and I think um, uh, I'm not gonna, I, I, I agree with what Rachel said, and, uh, and we have this perception of what advanced mathematics in high school is, right? Uh, and so advanced mathematics is STEM. Um, that's, that's the way we've always treated it. And so um, I just want to kind of go back to my point about making sure that as we offer pathways to students, that all students can be exposed to rigorous mathematics instead of uh, like what we see now in many cases. And I, I was a former high school teacher uh, before I started uh, teaching post-secondary and um, and it was you know algebra one geometry uh, and then uh, maybe you had uh, test prep to pass the state exit exam etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and now if we um, uh, give students options to where you can take a rigorous statistics course um, if you're not interested in, in a calc intending um, in, career field uh, that that we need to make sure that all students are engaging in advanced math and we need to broaden our perspective on what advanced math is uh, so I don't know if that was helpful or not uh, but uh, I just, I'll, just add, I'll just add one thing really quickly to what Connie said and the other thing that's sort of catalyzed by the conversations of, of catalyzing change from NCTM and the high, the high school version but then also um, this sort of discussion of branching out um, that that Connie discussed with the alternate high school math pathways is the need to engage. I, and I noticed um, Rachel's question asked about stakeholders, uh, college admissions. So college admissions is a really critical driver for, for what constitutes high status coursework in the high school. And as long as college admissions policies um, continue to sort of hold the calculus-based pathway as the only place where rigor uh, lies or what um, sort of advancement lies, um, then we're going to face a continuous struggle. Happily, a lot of, um, a lot of sort of major, major uh, uh, systems are having those conversations about how they can broaden what is sort of considered advanced mathematics in the high school. And the California system in particular, um, you know, does not necessarily specify particular 
courses as being, you know, sort of qualify for admission. So um, that you have to have a certain number and they're working very hard to sort of dismantle um, sort of preconceived notions about what is considered advanced. So that this is an ongoing conversation. There are lots of stakeholders involved in this and I think it's exactly right. The more, the, the lessons learned in the post-secondary space about um, math pathways and the importance of alignment to college and career, um, and how that then those lessons can be manifest in the high school is only going to create more equitable opportunities for students if it's done right and if all the stakeholders are in place and the right messages surround that movement. There was an interesting question um, about disaggregated data that's super important. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so the deal is when you really start to like get into disaggregated data, all of a sudden the weaknesses of the data, like there's just data is good, but data always has problems. So like, for example, um, California now pulls out Pacific Islander students from the Asian group. The Asian group is huge. And so all sorts of stuff gets massed in there. At my own college, um, we have just a statistic, 70% students of color. Uh, 20 to 35 percent um, or 25 to 30 percent uh, recent immigrants and refugees and one big group that I've become very passionate about is our um, Somali students who are um, a major subgroup and what box do they check on the race ethnicity 30 percent of our students are now picking multi so yeah Disaggregated data is a big deal, and then you run into all these issues. So what to do? What to do? Well, first off, know what your racial categories are at your college. So find out what's possible. And then if you as your math program want to go further, what we've recommended with TLC3 is you're going to have to do some local data collection and find ways to, um, like if you're going to do an assessment, maybe have some optional questions, not at the beginning, because that will trigger race um, stereotypes, right? But put them at the end after they finish to ask if they contribute, how they self-identify. Uh, this is a really big challenge, Jeff, and it uh, just needs some attention and some thoughtfulness and just working within the limitations of the data. Thank you for bringing it up. All right, anything else in the last few minutes y'all want to add? Um, great questions, great discussions going on in the chat. If you haven't really been watching that during the presentation, be sure and check it out when you get the information after the fact. I really liked um, someone in the chat window from Wake Tech volunteer that they are doing virtual study groups kind of emphasize, man, students need community in the STEM math pathway. It's long, it's arduous. <laughs> they need community. Now, not everyone needs community, but many students benefit from having a community, community collaborative, relational thing. So finding ways at your college to remind your faculty during the pandemic to find Zoom spaces. Mm, I'd love to see someone tackle this since maybe in an AMATIC newsletter for strategies for doing that out of class. That'd be awesome. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Connie and Ann and Helen for doing such a great job and sharing such valuable information. Y'all all have a great week and we will see you next time at the next webinar in January, if not before. Thanks a lot, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.